An early Ramadan Mubarak to all of you. Alhamdulillah uh, Thank you, Dr. Lumbar, for the uh, introduction. Uh, I appreciate you, Your Excellency Sheikh Ahinz, for being here and your gracious welcome. Dr. Ahmad Shaheen, may Allah bless you. Always a gracious host and so many friends and colleagues that are here. Alhamdulillah, that I always look forward to, to being with. I'm like, you know, I've talked about hope in Turkey now talked about hope in Bosnia, uh, I keep getting the hope topic. So this time I'm going to have to at least frame it a little bit differently. And I've given a different talk every time because this, this theme is so prominent in the Quran and in the hadiths of the Prophet ﷺ. But hope on the heels of Ramadan as we are waiting for the month of hope, truly the month of Ramadan, which offers a great sense of calibration. And one of the things that the scholars mentioned to us is that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what in shakartum la azidannakum if you are grateful I will increase you if you are grateful I will increase you Ramadan is a month of shukur it's a month of gratitude through fasting and through withholding ourselves from the many blessings that are readily available to us that we take for granted on a day-to-day -day basis and in the process of becoming more grateful I will increase you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not say what he increases you in. Because the reality is that there is nothing more comprehensive than shukur, than blessing. And the Prophet ﷺ, when he talks about this comprehensive blessing of gratitude, he says that the other side of gratitude, which is a sabr, which is patience, that no one will be given. No one will be given anything that is better or more expansive than patience. Because patience and gratitude allow you to ultimately have perspective through hardship and through ease and to stay focused on the goal of Allah's pleasure and His paradise. And when you have that perspective constantly focused on this ultimate goal, then everything starts to fall into place and everything starts to make sense. And one of the things that's happening to our world today is that because of how rapidly it is changing, very little seems to make sense. And when I cannot reconcile what is happening in the world with my place in it, then it doesn't matter how many material things that I have. It doesn't matter how easy life seems. I'm not going to be a happy or fulfilled person. And so I was thinking about what to talk about here to lead up to this beautiful month of Ramadan. And I know that Jamal is tired of interviewing people today. And I'm tired of being interviewed today. <laughs> so I'm hoping there are going to be no hard questions. It's going to be an easy interview after this, right? But one thing that is very apparent through these ayat, these verses, and these ahadith about hope is that the problem is that we become attached to the when. When? Meta. When? Meta Nasrullah. When is the help of Allah coming? Okay? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will continue to yastajibu li ahadikum. Allah will answer every one of your prayers until the person says, Da'utu fa da'utu, falam yustajabli. I kept making dua and Allah did not answer it. I was right there, but I wanted to, I wanted to know when. And I think a lot of times when we're looking at the timings of the trials of the prophets, you know, it's very easy to go through the trial of a prophet from page to the next page. The story of Yusuf, if you read it, how many have father in here? You're a hafad, aren't you? You got the text, the, the hat has, all right. How many pages is Surah Yusuf? How many pages is Surah Yusuf? No, I need to wake you all up. How many pages is Surah Yusuf? 
chapter 12. It depends on, there's only one Quran, Ya Ahmed. I'm sorry, I brought him from America. This is an American thing, you know. <laughs> Eight, nine pages, Yani. But you know what? You know when you start Surah Yusuf, how it's going to end. But Yusuf alayhi salam went through that for 21 years. 21 years of that uncertainty. And just when it seems like something's going to open up, the next thing happens. And the next thing happens. And the next thing happens. You know, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi drew the, the box, and he said that this is an insan, this is the human being. This is his ajal, this is his lifespan. And then he drew Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam this line through the box, and he said these are his amal, his, his hopes in life. And the hopes in life extend beyond the actual lifespan that you have. And then he drew these little khutut, these little lines, and he says, these are a'rab, hindrances. Some of them get you, some of them miss you. Okay? Some tests, they get you, and some tests, they miss you. You almost had a car accident. Didn't happen. It would have changed the entire trajectory of your, health, your, your life. Or you had a car accident, and it changed the entire trajectory of your life. How many near misses were there? And then it takes one. This one thing that almost happened, and these a'rad, subhanAllah, of course, we, we can't see the drawing of the Prophet ﷺ in front of us, but the way the, the Sahaba narrated it, right? Some of these a'rad, they, they're this close to getting you, and some of them are this close to getting you, and some of them are, th they're not all the same. There's one that's just about to get you, and it misses you. And then sometimes they get you in succession. You know, it's like the test happens, and the test happens, and the test happens, and the test happens. It seems like it's one after the other, right? With Yusuf alayhi salam, I'm finally seeing the light, literally, from the well. Next thing I know, I'm a slave. I'm finally starting to garner the favor of my master. Next thing I know, I'm a prisoner. I'm finally starting to see the light outside of the jail cell. Right? Because he told the, the prisoner, Tell the king about me. Meaning some, there's some light here. And the prisoner forgot him. The jail cell got darker. SubhanAllah, every single time. So that's 21 years. 21 years. Ayyub alayhi salam. You know, Ayyub alayhi salam. Uh, there's only six ayat, subhanAllah. Surah Sa'd al-Anbiya in the Quran about Ayyub alayhi salam. Powerful. Because it's always, it's at the end. It's when he's making dua for the end. The Prophet ﷺ said an authentic narration, بَقِيَ أَيُّوبُ فِي الْبَلَاءِ سَنَةً Ayyub السلام, was in that trial for 18 years. 18 years. He lost everything. All 10 of his children, dead. All of his wealth, gone. All of his health, gone. The only thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala left healthy was his tongue and his heart. Everything else he was tested with. 18 years. And so you read the six ayat and what they're packed with. But if you're in the place of Ayyub alayhi salam, 18 years is an eternity. 21 years is an eternity for Yusuf alayhi salam. Maryam alayhi salam, the course of her pregnancy. Those nine months were very, very long nine months. How many sleepless nights for her alayhi salam wondering, what's going to happen here? What's going to happen here? Where am I going to go? What comes next? Musa alayhi salam in exile as a fugitive. SubhanAllah. You know, it was, it was interesting. Uh, I was talking to a brother who came out of prison. It's interesting how different, different uh, prophet stories can relate to a person in any state that they're in. He's saying that idea of being a fugitive, SubhanAllah. And Musa alayhi salam worried about making the wrong move to attract attention to himself. All of that is there. But the point is, is the matta. When the Prophet in Mecca, that decade of suppression and oppression. And if you look at the Prophet ﷺ, every door shut in his face. Every single door shut in his face. His family's door shut in his face, Sallallahu The strangers he used to help shut in his face, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Mecca shut in his face, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The boycott, food, drink, torture, death. He's facing it all, right? And he finally sees a dream, glimpse of hope. And he goes to Ta'if. 
The fact that he thought Ta'if was going to be his refuge makes it that much worse. He thought Ta'if was the opening. And he said, I've never been treated worse than I was treated in Ta'if. The worst day of his life was in Ta'if. So subhanAllah, when you expect something great, and then you get the lowest point, Mata. When? When? Mata Nasrullah. When is the help of Allah coming? And to do taslim, to submit yourself to that meta, to that when, is the hardest one to do. Even, by the way, I speak to people that are active in causes for justice. One of the differences between the believer who works for justice and the one who works for justice, undoubtedly out of some of the good fitri elements, the good things that Allah put in human beings, to naturally incline towards al-adl, towards justice and mercy, is that for the believer, justice doesn't have to be imminent for them to still work as if it is. Justice doesn't have to be imminent for them to still work as if it is because they trust that Allah's time is better time. The Prophet said, Yasubu ibn Adam, that the son of Adam curses what? Ad-Dahr, curses time. You think it's time. لا تقول كلمة لو Don't say the word if. If I would have went here, if I would have took this route, some of you uh, might come a little late. If I wouldn't have if I wouldn't have missed this exit, if I would have gone here, when, when, if. Don't say it. Don't say it. And so time, submitting yourself to Allah's time, is the hardest form of submission to have hope. But once you relinquish that control of time or that perceived control of time and when. It is the most hopeful thing that you can bring to your heart. Mata Nasrullah, I don't know, but inna Nasrullahi Qareeb. It's close. It's close. When? It's close. I don't know. When is my dua going to be answered? When am I going to get out of the situation to submit the when to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Is your test. It is your test both on an individual and on a collective basis, as a community. When is Allah going to liberate Palestine? He will. Bi'idhnillahi ta'ala in our lifetime. We will pray in Al-Aqsa. Bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. We know. When? Nasrullahi qareeb. When's it going to happen? We don't know when, but we know that the one who controls when has better timing than we do. That's also a bitter pill to swallow sometimes. Allah's timing is better. Allah's timing is better. And subhanAllah, if you are an agent of hope, or if you are an agent of despair, and I want to I give some added language to that before I go on, because one of the most powerful things of Imam al-Shafi rahimahullah that I've heard, if you're an agent of hope or you're an agent of despair, someone might say, I'm not an agent of despair. If you're causing misery to someone in your life, family, friends, someone that is accountable to you in this life, if you're causing someone harm, you know, a lot of times we look at the tyrant on the big screen, we don't look at the tyrant in the mirror. Am I Avlan? La Tatlam. Don't wrong. La Tatlam. You won't be wronged. But you should fear wronging more than you should fear being wronged. Because the one who wrongs faces the consequences in the afterlife, the one who is wronged faces consequences in this world. Am I wronging? Am I an agent of misery for someone else with my tongue, ghiba, gossip? Did I ruin someone's reputation? Am I hurting my parents? Am I hurting my spouse? Am I hurting someone in my community? If you're an agent of despair, you also have to read these messages in a certain way. And if you're an agent of hope, a source of hope to someone else, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be a source of hope to you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not stop being in the service fi awn al-abd in the service of his slave Allah fi awn al-abd ma dama fi awn akhi as long as you're a servant as you are as long as you're in the servant of your brother or sister Allah is in your service subhanallah in this life and in the next Allah is in your service helping you supporting you so an agent of hope versus an agent of despair so what's the saying of Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah ta'ala he said, well, there's this one verse 
in the book of Allah. Sahmun. It's an arrow fi qalb al-zalim. Sahmun fi qalb al-zalim. Barsumun ala qalb al It's a source of hope to the heart of the oppressed. One verse, subhanAllah. Two people are reading the Quran. You got your Quranic studies professor here. One person reading the Quran, reading it entirely different. Not that the meaning changes, but the immediate implications to you, they change. Sahmun fi qalb al It's an arrow to the heart of the oppressor. Barsumun ala qalb al it is a relief on the heart of the oppressed. Does anyone know what that verse is? Anyone? I want to hear some guesses. I want to actually hear from you. Yeah, don't give me, uh, I can't hear you. No, but good guess. One more, yes. No, but it's a good guess. <laughs> you know what the verse is? Qala wa ma kana rabbuka nasiyya. Your Lord does not forget. Your Lord does not forget. Ma kana rabbuka nasiyya. Your Lord does not forget. Subhanallah. The zalim reads that. The tyrant reads that and thinks, I'm okay because I'm not facing the consequences of my tyranny or my harm, starts to feel a sense of intoxication, of their own power, deluded, right? That I'm harming and I'm not facing consequences. The one who is wronged thinks, this keeps happening to me. How is it that I see this person laughing, happy, and I'm in misery? It seems unfair. So Imam al-Shafi'i says that one ayah, if the tyrant reads it and ponders it, and if the oppressed reads it and ponders it, your Lord does not forget. Your Lord does not forget. I spoke about this in the context of the people of New Zealand. By the way, the most amazing human beings I've ever met in my life are the families of the shuhada in New Zealand. The most righteous, amazing human beings I've met. SubhanAllah, I've spoken about them. I've been in Hajj, alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, every year for over a decade. And I remember, you know, I spoke about this Arafah, the most beautiful Arafah of my life. It was like this perfect rain, this cloud that came over us and started raining beautifully and just perfectly. And you saw the families of the Shuhada in New Zealand. And I was like, SubhanAllah, maybe that Allah is just blessing all of us because of their presence. These people are amazing human beings. Beautiful people. And the shuhada, may Allah accept them. Beautiful people, subhanAllah. And you're looking at the trial of the killer. One of the injustices that compounds injustice in the United States, by the way, is that after a murderer murders, especially if that murderer is from a privileged class, even if they make it to the courtroom and all the loopholes are exhausted, but just having to come to the courtroom and then see it every day and play through the evidence and know that at the end, you're probably not going to get a semblance of justice. And even if you do, it'll be a few years. There was a woman in my, in my city, a Tatiana Jefferson, who was killed by the police. She was play, playing Xbox with her nephew and an officer shot her through the window of her home. She shares a driveway with the masjid. Someone did a wellness check because the door was open. It was beautiful weather that day, and she left the screen door to get fresh air, and someone called and said her door is open. Officer came, saw her, shot her through the window while she was playing Xbox with her kid. The trial still hasn't happened. It's been over three years. We haven't even got to the trial yet. Since then, both of her parents have died. And you say, SubhanAllah, the delay, and then watching them in the courtroom, the murderers come up there, you get to represent yourself, the dead is slandered and basically turned into an appropriate victim for murder, someone whose life you shouldn't have cared that much about, all the dirt that you can bring out and they're not there to defend themselves. And you think, what injustice in this world. Your Lord does not forget. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he talks about the day of judgment, inna Allah sari'ul hisab. Allah is swift with the hisab on the day of judgment. 
swift. It happens. The, 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 the tyrants will be ants that are trampled on the Day of Judgment, the Prophet said. Surah al they're little ants, trampled. They, their situation is well known. The oppressed are comforted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In Allah sari'u al Allah is quick, swift. But you have to give up the desire for now. Not stop working for it, but give up your attachment to the result now. You have to. You have to. Or else you'll never be content with your personal du'as, with your du'as for the oppressed, with your desire to see an end, you have to give up the attachment to the result. And then you build on that. And the Prophet ﷺ says, the one who is planting a seed, if you have in your hand a little plant, in qamat as and the day of judgments here, like imagine how demoralizing it is <laughs> to be planting a plant and then looking up and seeing the skies are splitting. What am I going to get out of this? Right? How demoralizing is that, right? Like, anyone going to come eat after this? Is anyone going to? But whoever amongst you can plant it, then do so. SubhanAllah, do so. For the millisecond before the earth is actually destroyed, there might be something in there that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses you with. Don't say, what's this? لا تحقيرنا من المعروف شيئا Don't belittle the smallest good thing. And don't think about the mechanics of the good that you're doing. You know, I think about Ibrahim alayhi salam when he establishes the Kaaba, when he builds the Kaaba with Ismail alayhi salam. وَإِذْ يَرْفَعُ إِبْرَاهِيمُ الْقَوَاعِدَ مِنَ الْبَيْتِ وَإِسْمَعِيلُ رَبَّنَا تَقَبَّلْ مِنَّا إِنَّا كَانْتَ سَمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ I mean, look how hopeful his dua is. He's in the middle of a barren desert. وَادٍ غَيْرِ ذِي زَرْفِ Truly, no, nothing. Believe it or not, the clock tower wasn't even there yet. I know that's hard for some people to believe. It wasn't there. What about the KFC? The KFC wasn't there yet. <laughs> Maybe if you're Ahd al-Tabi'in, I mean. <laughs> no, no KFC, no nothing, right? فِي وَادٍ غَيْرِ ذِي زَرْفِ It's a barren desert. And think about how hopeful his dua is. He's looking around with his son Ismail. رَبَّنَا تَقَبَّلْ مِنَّا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ Oh Allah, accept it. You hear and you know. And he makes dua for what? رَبَّنَا تَقَبَّلْ مِنَّا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ السَّمِيرُ إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ السَّمِيرُ عَلِيمُ رَبَّنَا وَجَعَلْنَا مُسْلِمَيْنِ لَكَ وَمِنْ ذُرِّيَّتِنَا أُمَّةً مُسْلِمَةً لَكَ He's making dua for nations. You only got your boy with you. Umam, nations, that will submit to you like we are. أَرِنَا مَنَاسِكَنَا وَتُبْ عَلَيْنَا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ التَّوَّابُ الرَّحِيمُ Show us our rituals and accept our repentance. You are the one who accepts all repentance. رَبَّنَا وَبْعَثْ فِيهِمْ رَسُولٍ And O oh Allah, amongst that umam, those umam of those people that will come, send amongst them the best messenger who will recite upon them the verses, teach them the book in its wisdom and purify them. Verily, you are the Almighty and the All-Wise. I mean, subhanAllah, look how hopeful that dua is. But you know what? Even Ibrahim had a moment where when he built the Kaaba. Allah Azza wa Jal told him, call. Adhan. And he looked around and he said, Rabbi, wa ma yablu salti. Like, who am I calling? <laughs> Where is my voice going to go? I'm in the middle of a desert, right? Imagine being in a desert, no one around you, and Allah says, Adhan. Go ahead and call. Wa ma yablu salti. Adhan wa alayya al Just do your part. Do your part. Until today, we're answering the call of Ibrahim Can you imagine that? How many thousands of years later, we're still responding, لَبَيْكَ اللَّهُمَّ لَبَيْكَ لَبَيْكَ اللَّهُمَّ لَبَيْكَ We're all coming from all over the world, through different planes, through different vehicles, on the backs of different animals. Some people still do that. We're still responding to the call of Ibrahim Just do your part. Now, what does this mean as we come into the month of Ramadan? And inshallah ta'ala, I'll end with this. I don't know how long I've gone, by the way, but I'm assuming that my time is, uh, is limited at this point. One of the things that's so beautiful about how the Prophet ﷺ taught us to make dua, particularly when it comes to repentance and redemption, is that the Prophet ﷺ said, don't attach any conditions to it whatsoever. is the general. Call upon Allah and you are certain that he will answer it in a way that's best for you, right? One of the things that's very powerful, subhanAllah, as you are making dua, the Prophet ﷺ said, do not say, 
Allahumma in shit. Oh Allah, if you want to, forgive me. You know how sinful you are. You know how perfect Allah is. Prophet said, don't say, if you want to forgive me. If you will. Say, Allahumma khirli. Rabbi khirli warhamni. Rabbi khirli wa tub alayya innaka anta tawwab rahim My Lord, forgive me and have mercy on me. You are the acceptor of repentance. Have that full hope. And there is nothing more beautiful and more powerful than Allah taking away your mountains of sins in a moment. That's greater than the change of nations, geopolitics in a moment. When Allah Azza wa Jal hears you and you say, Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk, one night, one moment of sincerity, and Allah says, Ghafartu lak. Ya Abdi, Ghafartu lak. I forgave you for everything. Every single moment, every, the, the sins you remember and the sins you don't remember. And there are a lot that you don't remember. There's a lot that I don't remember. And you just say, my Lord, forgive me. And it's gone. Just like that. That's all it takes. A moment of sincerity. And you're certain in it. SubhanAllah. Say, oh my servants who have transgressed against themselves, do not despair from the mercy of Allah. If you're putting your trust in your abilities, in your own turning the page, Allah knows sometimes we say we're going to turn the page and we don't. We get weak again. We might be sincere when we say we're going to change, but we don't change. So what are you putting your hope in? Inna Allah yaghfiru dhunuba jami'a. Put it on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah forgives all sins. That doesn't mean you don't try. But I don't want to even tie my forgiveness. Oh Allah, forgive me if I really do change. Not even that. Not even that. You know, like if you're, if you're seeking forgiveness from someone and you've messed up multiple times, you say, give me one more chance. And I promise you this time will be different. Don't even do that with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't limit what is limitless in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Put it towards him. Inna Allah yaghfiru dhunuba jami'a. Inna huwa al-ghafur rahim. Because he is most forgiving, most, for, most merciful. And the Prophet sallallahu taught us in the last 10 nights of Ramadan, you will never be more practicing in any point of the year than you are in the last 10 nights of Ramadan, right? The average Muslim will never be more practicing than they are in the last 10 nights of Ramadan. But look at your dua. Allahumma inna ka afuun. Oh Allah, you are the one who forgives. وَصَلَّيْتُ لَكَ وَصُمْتُ لَكَ No, you don't cite your good deeds. You don't say, Oh Allah, you love to forgive. And I, I've been praying Qiyamul Layl. And I've been fasting. فَعْفُ anni, So forgive me. Ya Allah, I'm trying. No. Allahumma innaka afu. Not Allahumma inni. Allahumma innaka. Oh Allah, I am fasting. Oh Allah, no, no. Oh Allah, you are afu. You are the one who forgives. To hibbul afwa. You love to forgive. Fa'fu anni. So forgive me. That means that whether you are a person who is praying all night long and fasting the fast of the companions, or you are a person who's barely making it through Ramadan with the fara'ad, you're both invoking the same thing, Allah's mercy, not your portfolio. And that's hopeful. That's actually hopeful. Because you know what happens when Ramadan starts? You got your lofty goals and then 10, 15 days in, it's like... This is not going the way I planned. <laughs> Don't cite your own portfolio. Allahumma inna ka'afu tuhibbul afu fa'afu anni. That's hope. So Ramadan is a month of change. It's a month of hope. It's a month of blessing. It's a month where your heart is in the best place and your mind is in the best place and your du'as are most likely to be sincere. But what you're tying your hope to is His mercy and still not your portfolio. Not your good deeds. Right? It's His mercy that you are tying yourself to. It's His ability to redeem you. Not whether you've proven yourself to be redeemable at this point in your life. It's His ability to change the hal, to change the situation of this ummah. I have to end with one thought that I want to connect this all to because there's the when. There was a powerful thought that was put in my head some time ago that I've never shook off. 
When we talk about the glory of Islam in America, Malcolm X, Muhammad Ali, and what happened in America with this large conversion of people to Islam. Someone mentioned something to me that I never will forget. He said, I wonder whose dua in the 1800s on the slave plantations where people were being beaten and having their Qur'ans taken away. Which righteous woman called out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the midst of those beatings? And said, Ya Allah, let Islam live in this land. Bring about people that will carry the deen in this land. It shook me. You never know. Those people could be the answer of someone's dua. You didn't see the equation. She didn't, or he didn't put the when. But it could be that that's the mechanics by which it happens. Al-Aqsa will be liberated one day. It might be your dua, and you know what? It might be answered after you die. But it may be that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers your dua. The people that are being hurt, the despair that we see in the world, it's Allah's time, but you don't know whose dua it will be. But ultimately, what makes the dua accepted or not is His mercy. SubhanAllah, wa idha sa'alaka ibadi anni fa inni qareeb. When my servant calls upon me, I am close, is on the same page of the one ayah in the Quran about Ramadan. Shahr Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al Quran. As if to say, this is the month of du'a. This is not just the month of fasting. This is the month of du'a. This is the month of calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So do not forget your ummah in your du'as in this month. Do not forget the struggling and the suffering in your du'as in this month. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it from us all. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow for great things to happen. And for us to be a part of that greatness. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make our scales weigh heavy on the day of judgment. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not make us amongst those who wrong, but those who are wronged and seek the redemption in the hereafter. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala count us amongst those who are forgiven. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to be a people who call upon him with sincerity and confidence in his answer. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us for our shortcomings. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pour upon us patience. Rabbana afrigh alayna asalam. May Allah pour upon us patience وَثَبِّتْ أَقْدَامَنَا And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make our feet firm and grant us victory over those who harm us. Allahumma ameen. Jazakum Allah khayram. As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.